to our yin session and we'll need two cushions i mean i say two cushions because i have two kind of average size scatter cushions but if you have a big yoga bolster that's amazing grab that or a bigger cushion that's great um and then if you know that you have uh, uh, tight hips then two yoga blocks would be good if you have tight hips and you want to use blocks but you don't have blocks at home then you can use a big fat old book uh it works very well or a tupperware from the kitchen um would also work of this of similar dimensions and then make sure you have blankets uh, warm things with you socks um, nice comfy things um and yes we're gonna we're gonna get started so our uh theme for today is uh or this week has been fire um and we needed the fire flow on thursday it's been freezing cold in johannesburg and uh, today for our yin session, we'll explore the yogic kind of term or exploration of fire in your practice, in your body, in your life, which is known as tapas. And I'm going to link it to, which is one of the nyamas. I'll explain all of this and I'm going to link it to two other nyamas. So um, it all makes sense. And I feel like it's actually a good theme to end with because um, it practically, uh, the way these three nyamas mesh is a wonderful lesson in um, continuing to practice yoga off the mat in a fruitful way in your life um, yeah, going forward. So I hope that you enjoy it. And we're going to begin in a Supta Baddha Konasana, which is just the most wonderful, relaxing, restorative pose. So you'll have two cushions behind you or one long bolster and you're going to have your feet together soles of the feet together and you can place those books or blocks um, or even two rolled up towels is also nice underneath the thighs so that they're nice and comfy and then i invite you to lie back onto your cushion make sure that your feet um, are not you're not straining to have them close in towards the seat of the body they can be a little bit away from them and then i invite you place to place your hands on the rib cage on either side of the rib cage and here i invite you to close your eyes and to tune into your breath so let's connect with that essential rhythm of inhalation and exhalation, your rhythm of breath. Perhaps you feel when you focus on your breath at first that just sensations of atmosphere and air touching the nostrils, touching the nose, touching the area of skin above the upper lip between the nostrils. And that's a great and useful way to tune the mind to breath. So particularly if your mind feels quite scattered or you have, you're you not quite focused, really tune into the sensations on the skin, the sensations of the breath. And let that be a guide and a tool in calming your mind. Let that be your entryway into your practice. I invite you to embrace this time we have together this evening in a restorative practice. And I invite you to do so by being fully present mentally and also giving yourself the space to feel, to be, to relax, to soak it up. Whatever occurs, mind and body, whatever you feel, however you are as you arrive on your mat now. I give you permission and encourage you to embrace that, embrace the context, embrace how you feel, and not try to limit the experience with a preconceived idea. Don't try to limit the experience with any stage rejecting aspects of body and mind let us embrace it all and as you follow the cadence of your breath 
feel as though your brain and your face become soft and relaxed. Feel as though the muscles over the jaw and the face, even down the neck and the shoulders, really relax. Let it be a giving, a giving way as you make space for yourself this evening and all that occurs on the mat. I invite you to lean into the stillness that you feel right now. This is the full intention for our practice, for our yin practice always, is to lean into stillness. Let the hips open, to let the muscles be soft, to let the organs be soft, to let the breathing be subtle. Soak up this moment fully and to allow yourself to expand mind, body, emotions into the structure of the pose. And so the niyamas that we will be speaking of today, that we will be contemplating on, are fundamental moral codes written in the Yoga Sutras, the oldest yogic texts, foundation of our practice. So through these simple postures, we will contemplate a return to source, to the essential aspects of our practice. And these niyamas are not like, say, the Ten Commandments. They're not rules. They are more like observances. More like ways to guide ourselves into positive behavior on the mat and off the mat. More like suggestions, advice giving than rules or commandments. the last sort of minute here in our first posture hold I invite you to lengthen your breath so we began with a subtle breath for, for the next kind of 10 rounds of inhalation and exhalation I invite you to breathe in deeply in your own at your own pace and to breathe out fully and deeply at your own pace moving through 10 cycles of breath trying to make the breath nice and long and full and calming and cooling and trying not to force or strain at the top and the bottom of the breath. Let it be a rhythmical and let it be a rhythmical ebb and flow that comes with ease rather than with straining. Perhaps you feel the more extensive rise and fall of belly and ribs with this. Just be fully aware of the changing sensations. Coming into the last few rounds. So 
And when you've completed your 10th long full exhalation, I invite you to inhale and stretch your arms above your head. Don't rush it if you're still going through those 10 cycles. And you can draw the knees up towards each other and draw your knees in towards your chest. So you might lift your bum off the floor slightly and then just rock from side to side, feeling the cushions beneath you. And keeping contact with arms to knee, I invite you to come to a seated position and to grab the cushions that were behind you and to bring them forwards in front of you. So we are going to stay with that shape of the konasana. If you needed blocks or books uh, previously, keep them where they are now to support the groins. Build a castle of cushions and blankets in front of your belly, and then with a round spine. So don't try and flex or strain or stretch. Allow yourself to fall forwards, to relax forwards, to melt forwards. Make sure that your head is supported and really embrace the rounding of the spine here as it is, as you are. Let the belly be soft. Let the neck be long and soft. And so tapas, one of our five niyamas, is a Sanskrit word, of course, and the root of the word is tap, which means to burn. And tapas is our fiery discipline or passionate courage it's described at, as in, in our practice. Through fiery discipline, through passionate and full-hearted engagement in our practice of yoga, or in fact any discipline in life that you're engaged in, what happens is we begin to burn away our impurities. Now that has two meanings. The first is, of course, in the yoga practice, when you do a full, full-hearted flow and physical practice, you, and in fact, it is also the case in a soft practice, but more so in a, in a, more, in a more physical practice, you burn away the pure impurities in a physical sense. So you begin to detoxify the body and you help the, nat the body's natural ability to detoxify and release toxins and bring, invite in the process of healing and rejuvenation. And that is the first superficial meaning of, of this aspect of tapas. And the second meaning of that burning away impurities means that we burn away our self-limiting mindsets so when you engage fully in any practice or discipline with a wholehearted approach and a fiery adherence and fiery discipline you actually prove to yourself that you are more capable than you think and so these impurities would be impurities of the mind, self-limiting beliefs. And in this sense, tapas is not a serious, austere, or solemn nyama. So sometimes in some very rigid yoga practices, uh, very and very physical ones, people talk of tapas in only the sense of discipline and kind of bodily perfection and achieving certain very elaborate poses and so on. And they would say that it is your responsibility in tapas to push yourself to do these things and push yourself to wake up at 5 a.m. to begin your practice and so on. But that is not, that is a, a very limited interpretation of this yamas. It's, it is more a heart pumping love for your practice. It is more an approach to doing that is full of 
passion and joy doing it for the love of it. There's an engagement with your practice that allows you to completely lose yourself time and place and be fully immersed in it. And through that fiery, passionate application, you burn away the impurities of body, yes, fine, but more importantly, mind. You expand your perception of yourself and what you thought was possible for your body, for yourself in life. Coming into the last few breaths of this hold. All these forward folds that we do in a restorative fashion are cooling for the body and cooling for the nervous system. So actually, it was interesting that we talk about fire and tapas because these forward folding postures are calming for the nervous system and they activate the cooling aspects of the body they actually are counter to our fiery postures and absolutely essential to a yin practice on your next inhalation gently lifting up your torso and you can just move the cushions to one side and you can keep your legs out in the, your kanasana last few moments like this turn to face you stay where you are and from here you can softly lean out towards your right side bringing your left arm overhead look up towards the ceiling lengthen your neck so i'm bringing my elbow down on the right side but if you that's not possible for you then you just on your hand propped up on your hand lengthen through the neck open the torso towards the front and stretch the side body left side and exhale and then close your chest to the floor and reach forwards as much as you can making a lovely semicircle and then open up on the other side again lengthen through the neck just make it a very kind of natural and enjoyable stretch like a stretch first thing in the morning lovely natural and full stretch without pretense or forcing and then exhale close the body sweeping your way back to the other side you're just going to flow side to side a few times so if it suits your breath to go a little faster than me or a little slower that's perfectly fine inhalation is to up to move up and open and exhalation is to close down and move to the other side maybe you want to integrate a bit of a neck stretch with it maybe finishing off with two more full cycles one on each side and then exhale return to the center then draw the knees up towards each other and then straighten the legs out in front of you you don't have to strain to have them perfectly straight if your hamstrings are very tight your knees will be slightly bent now and that's completely fine you won't stay here for too long but we want to do something that's very nice and relieving for the back of the neck um, and the upper back i'll do it from the side it's easier to see so you're going to round in look in towards your chest bringing your hands clasped at the back of your head and then allow the spine to round as well as though you now want to draw your elbows in to touch your hips so that's not to say that that is what's happening my elbows aren't touching my hips either but the movement is to really round in and down and bring elbows towards the hips And then inhale to lift up, 
push your head back against your hands, hands into the back of the head. So resistance between the two and open the elbows out. Maybe even look up towards the ceiling. And then exhale, let's round in. Inhale, let's open up. Exhale, round in. Inhale to open up. This time as we exhale and round in, it'll be the last time. And I invite you to pulse a little bit with your breath. So if you want to quickly look at what I'm doing, what that means is a quick movement like this. And it's kind of at a cadence of, I don't know, one every second, elbows towards hips. And maybe just do 10 of those pulses, very nice and relieving for any tension or stasis in the neck and upper back. Just do 10 of them. And then inhale to open up. Exhale to release your hands. And we're going to recline back again to make sure you've got space behind you as you slowly recline back. And then you're gonna grab your, one of your cushions, or if you have a yoga block or a nice big fat book, use that. And lift up your hips just enough, feet to the floor, knees, I should have said that, bent. And you're gonna lift up just enough to bring that block, cushion, or book underneath your lower spine. So if you have a block, a yoga block or a book, make sure that it's really placed where over your coccyx, so the very, very base of the spine, the base of your, like where your tail would protrude. Make sure your feet are hip width apart here, and then draw the knees in towards each other. So let the knees touch each other. To do that, if you have to open your feet wider than hip width, that's also fine. Toes pointing in towards each other, like pigeon toed. And then you can draw your arms up alongside your head, making a frame for your face. So elbows in line with shoulders. So this is the supported or um, uh, yeah, your supported bridge pose or restorative bridge pose. That's you want to close your eyes and focus on the sensation at the base of the spine as cushion or block or book meets the base of the spine. And indeed focus on the cadence of the breath. So on the mat, in a very practical sense, what tapas means, of course, is not to push yourself hard physically or indeed to be really focused by any kind of physical goals or ideals. That is not really what it, it means. What it means practically on the mat is a commitment to turn up with consistency and integrity. So that doesn't mean in a mechanical sense that you just have to be there, just be present, and that you should just do it because it's in the calendar and it's scheduled and it has to be done. What it means, and that's where that word integrity is important, is that you practice in response and in a reflexive way to how you feel on that day. And you turn up, even if you may be are not in a perfectly physical condition that you think you should be for yoga or anything like that, but you turn up with integrity, you turn up in a way that is, feels right and good and feeds and nourishes and responds to your body and where you are at that time. And that takes commitment, that takes a fiery passion and discipline, but it is a more subtle interpretation of that. It is a more nuanced and careful and loving interpretation of that. And of course, to achieve that, you always have to practice in balance with 
it's a, another of the niyamas, which is a himsa. You might have heard of that before. It means um, to do no harm. And that is very important, not just, of course, to do no harm to any other living creature, but it is very important on the mat in a practical sense with and in, in interrelated with your tapas. And that is because it is to do no harm to self, to body, to always respect what you need, what is right, what is integral and nourishing for your body and indeed your mind on the mat. And for some people, tapas, a fiery discipline, is in fact a determination to be soft, to be kind. For some of us, it is easier to force our bodies, to force ourselves into doing things, whether it's yoga or other pursuits or work in life. Our default is to strain and overdo it. And tapas, therefore, for that person, the path of least resistance, the path of habit is to hurt yourself, to go beyond what is nourishing and right and fitting and integral. And therefore, tapas, for that type of personality, is in fact a commitment to not overdoing it consistently. And that can take an incredible amount of self-determination and will. If you find your mind wandering at any time in your practice, I invite you to gently and smilingly bring your mind back to your breath. Smilingly bring your awareness back to the mat and the simple framework of this posture. And from here, when you're ready, I'll invite you to draw your arms down and place them alongside the book or the cushion beneath your coccyx. And to then inhale and lift your legs up. So elevate your legs. And with the support under your coccyx, it should feel quite effortless to do so. There should be no strain to do so. And just test how you feel. Straighten your legs up with bent knees. If from there, if that feels effortless for you, if that feels like a strain, then keep those knees firmly bent and the heels close into the bum. So just test for you. But if it is comfortable for you to hold your legs aloft, doesn't have to be a perfect straight line, then I invite you to do so. And so transitioning from the supported bridge pose to a supported inversion here. This is an accessible inversion for anybody to do at any time of the day or night. And a lovely way to give your heart a rest, to reboot the circulatory system. When you go into an inversion, you quite literally give your heart a holiday because the greatest effort of the heart is to pump blood back up against gravity. 
And so for these few moments, you allow the blood to drain and the lymph nodes to drain and the tension, or strain or fatigue in the legs to drain down. And just become aware of sensations in your feet or your toes. Maybe they become a bit cooler, tingling as the blood drains on the feet. And so that aspect of tapas that helps us to burn away impurities of the mind is an incredibly important aspect because it helps us to empower ourselves, to take us beyond what we previously thought was our realm of possibility. That is the burning away the fire of practice that burns away self-limiting beliefs and self-doubt. And the fire as an element is transformational. It represents destruction and it also represents creation and new life. So when we apply ourselves with this fiery but mindful discipline, to something, we usher in the elements and the characteristics of that element of fire, and that is transformation. We channel the fire energy, whether it's on our mat, in our practice, or in other pursuits. And often that means stepping out of your comfort zone. Often that means having the discipline or self-will to do something that is not what is the habit or the easy road. And that stepping out of your comfort zone is tantamount to facing fears, tantamount to ushering in the process of transformation. And so what is so beautiful about tapas as a passionate, fiery discipline with regards to facing our fears and coming out of our comfort zone is an image of us almost dancing with fire. So again, in facing your fears and coming out of your comfort zone, you are not doing so in a way that is harmful and harsh and against what feels natural and right for your body and what is in, like overly difficult or destructive. It is rather a stepping out of your comfort zone and facing your fears with passion and an embrace and a joy for the chosen discipline, for the chosen practice. And that is an image of dancing with fire to grow your personal potential and to purify mind and body. From here, I invite you to lower your feet and you can hug your knees in towards your chest and press your lower spine into the block, book or cushion just for a few breaths. And then exhale to release your feet to the floor, placing them hip width apart. And from here with your next inhalation, gently and slowly lifting your hips enough to move the block or whatever you had under your lower spine out the way. And then I invite you to 
lower your coccyx to meet the mat super, super, super slowly. Like each millimeter of the spine and the back slowly returns to the mat and you're fully mindful of all of the intricate and subtle and minute different changing sensations of that highly charged nervous center, which is the base of your spine. Just be fully present with all the sensations as lower spine meets the mat. Turning the gaze inwards. And from here, we can go into a reclining twist with Garudasana legs. So taking your right leg over the left, I invite you to make in those Garudasana or eagle legs, which is like to wrap your right leg around the left twice. Now, if that second wrap of foot around the inside of the left leg does not happen for you, that's fine. Just make the one wrap, which is almost like sitting cross-legged in a chair, that same shape. And then from here, open the arms out, palms facing down with arms shoulder width apart. And I invite you to shift enough onto your left side of your, um, of your hips to bring those legs, both of them, in the Garudasana shape over towards the left side. Now, if, the, if it feels more comfortable for you, place a cushion underneath your legs and that will make it more restorative and more soft and and juicy and then look away from the direction your knees are pointed and don't strain as you do that and then maybe close your eyes And so the second niyama that works so beautifully, meshes so beautifully with tapas is spadyaha, which means self-study. The Sanskrit word sva is human soul and yaha means lesson or reading. And of course, as is the case with tapas, there are multiple reading, sort of multiple aspects to this and I'm going to outline them and obviously draw as to why it works so beautifully with tapas. So the first aspect of svadhyaha or the self-study is to study and to embark on a self-discovery of the divine within us. So this is written in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras a lot. And there is a focus on how the process of turning inwards, the self-study, is not so much a study of I and me and my body, but a study of how whatever you believe, universe, light, source, intelligence, God, Allah, whatever your, whatever the framework of understanding resonates with you, the word resonates with you. The idea of Svadhyaha is to turn inwards to better discover and learn and realize how the divine lives and expresses within us, within our minds, within our bodies, within the ego, within the thoughts, within the emotions. And the other aspect of that self-study is the study of our habits, of our thoughts and our ego in particular. That's more focused on the I. And it is considered to be very critical and important in alignment with your practice, 
discipline, your fire, your application of your chosen form on the mat, that you engage in trying to understand your habits, your mind patterns, your thoughts, and the role of the ego. And this is important because our ego in yogic philosophy is really considered to be almost our enemy. And that is because not that you should wage a war with yourself in any way, but more that our ego is very concerned with situational things, with material things. It is very concerned with survival. And a lot of the lessons, the more subtle lessons of the first aspect of Shradhyaha, of the divine within, occur and are learnt in the layer beneath that. So when you hear of the yogi say that the ego, we diminish the ego, the ego is the enemy, and so on, that is a very superficial way to express it. What it really means is that you have to look beyond, you have to see the spaces beneath and between the details in the woods of the ego, to look in a more refined and detailed and subtle way and to see beyond it. On your next inhalation, I invite you to lift your legs up, draw them to the center and let's swap over to the other side of our Garudasana reclining twist. So left over right, find those pretzel legs, the expression of it that feels right for you. Bring the cushion over to the other side if you used it on that left side. And then when you're ready, arms out and allow those legs to go out towards the right side. If you're like me, you like to be a little bit more over onto the side body in a reclining twist, then I invite you to wiggle around a little bit to achieve that open the chest out towards the ceiling, and then look over towards the left side. Try and soften into your feet, into your belly, into your legs. And of course, another aspect of Svadhyaha is encouraging one to study the theory, study the history, know the scriptures, know the theoretical framework, know the details and the genesis of your chosen practice. So if it's yoga, it's of course to study the, well, the scriptures of yoga and allow that to color and deepen your physical practice. But if it's another type of practice that you so enjoy and brings you mindfulness and peace and health and fulfillment in your life, that exact same principle applies. Study the masters, study the teachers before you, study other practitioners and how they work and allow that to layer and deepen your practice. And from this, of course, we also learn from the mistakes of others. We lean on the shoulders of those who have practiced before us. And this is entering onto what in yoga text is known as the marga, the path. Each step you take on it is a step that in some way covers the imprint of a foot of somebody who walked the path before you. And being aware of that brings so much meaning and comfort to us in whatever path we have chosen. And Svadhyaha, importantly, encourages us to study our habits on the mat, 
and off the mat. So there's a very, very important and very simple concept which I often return to and have for many years in my practice, which is aligned to Svadhyaha. Super, super simple. And it goes, watch your thoughts. Your thoughts become your words. Your words become your actions. Your actions become your habits. Your habits become your character. And your character becomes your destiny. So observation and study of self begins and certain the certain very very critical key aspect of it is in watching your thoughts. What are your hang-ups and your idiosyncrasies? What are the narratives that you tell yourself on your mat? As our mind is a muscle. So you become better at watching those thought patterns on the mat. So too, you become better at watching those thought patterns off the mat. And these percolate into every aspect of our lives, our relationships, and eventually our futures. And so what seems like a very simple and menial task of observing the narrative you tell yourself when you get into a posture in yoga is actually a profound investment in your future. I invite you to inhale and draw your knees up towards the center again. And then to release the Garudasana legs and open your feet out into a happy baby. Let's make it a nice rocking one. Just moving from side to side, clasping the outside of each foot. Maybe allowing the knee and the quad of each leg to touch the floor on each side if that's accessible to you. If not, that's fine. Just enjoying the rocking from side to side, the opening of the hips. And returning to the center. And from here, just rocking up into a seated position. And we're going to turn our knees out towards the side and come up onto our, into a tabletop, onto our hands and knees. And from here, we're going to go into the Anahatasana or heart melting pose. Most lovely, lovely pose for spinal health and your shoulders and upper back. So I'm going to demonstrate without any props. So it's to keep a bum over knees and to soften the chest to the floor. My chin comfortably reaches the floor, but if your neck is stiff, you'll bring your forehead to the floor. And once you're there, ask yourself if this is comfortable enough to hold for three or four minutes. If it is not, then lift your chest up and get a cushion and place it under your chest so that arch in the upper spine is less acute. If you have sensitive knees, you might also want to put a towel or a blanket underneath each knee. So just find a degree of comfort here in your heart melting pose. And then close your eyes. And this is exactly why they say yoga is the journey of the self. 
through the self to the self. And that is really speaking to Svadhyaya, to the Niyama of Skiadhyaya. That through self study, through the journey of the practice of yoga and the mindful self study of it, you move beyond, you learn to see the details in fullness of the ego and your experience in this body, in this time, on this planet. And you see through that, you learn to study that, and then through studying that and understanding that and embracing it and working with it, you begin to see the details between it. And that allows you to see the divine within you. So that is the to the self. And so the third nyama that meshes so well with tapas and svadhyaya is Ishvara Pranidana, meaning supreme being or fixing. That's the direct translation from Sanskrit. But what it can be, I guess, more easily understood as is to surrender. The word surrender really encapsulates the meaning of Ishvara Panidana. And it is the fifth of the five niyamas. And for in ancient times, it was considered the most easy, the given, the final. You got over the mountain of the other ones. This is a given. It's super easy. It brings sweetness and it ties everything else together. Of course, the, not less, any less important, but considered to be a relatively straightforward and accessible aspect of the niyamas. And I think that's because for the ancients, this idea of surrendering. So offering yourself up to something greater, something abstract, something beyond yourself is maybe a little bit more familiar. But to the modern mind, this aspect of yoga, to surrender, to offer up your practice in the surrender, you know, to dedicate your practice to a higher power or a divine, is seen as super strange and weird and almost unnecessary. In fact, we spend so much of our time as teachers and modern yoga practitioners trying to take this element of yoga out, to make it very practical, to make it very physical focused, physically focused. On your next inhalation, lift your chest up, shoulders up, come out of the Anahatasana, Bring your hands underneath your shoulders and we can just flow through five full rounds in your own time of cat cow so do this in your time your breath inhalation to arch exhalation to round And then I invite you from there to walk your hands forward and lower your chest on towards your mat, onto your mat, on towards. And then bring your hands on the outside of your mat, lift your elbows up and away from your torso and make your hands into like a spider or like you have a little cupcake under each hand if you don't want to squash it. And so lift up the heel of the hand, lift up the elbows. And then from there, with the breath, inhale and lift up your chest to your edge. Exhale to lower your chest. And so we're going to flow with the breath like we've just done in the cat cow. Inhale to up, exhale to lower. 
And so with opening your arms out like this wider than the mat and keeping the elbows out and proud away from the body, you should feel a deeper sense of expansiveness and openness in the shoulders. And so flow with your breath. And if it feels right, maybe finding a bit of a, an organic or intuitive flow to the movement. So maybe pressing more into one shoulder if that needs love and care. Maybe stretching the side of the neck on one side. Maybe elevating the elbow a bit more on the other side as you come up. However, your spine calls for you to move with the breath and give love, some love to your shoulders and upper back and your neck. I invite you to do five more cycles of breath here like this. And on your fifth, once you've done that fifth exhalation, do a sixth inhalation and let's hold in what's called the seal pose. So you'll straighten your elbows. If your back is very stiff or you have spinal problem, remember you don't want to go too deeply into the pose. So you'd move your hands further away from you and further apart from each other. If your back is more su supple, your hands are closer towards you. Um, and closer towards each other, but they should never get closer than the width of the mat. So the seal pose is different to the cobra in the sense that the arms are always wide, the elbows are straight, the hands are always in front of you, and then you can look down at the floor between your hands. Soften your glutes, make sure that your shoulders are moving down and away from your ears, so the shoulder blades together and we'll just hold this for a few breaths and this I guess allows us to contemplate that one aspect of Ishvara Pranidana and surrender is to surrender to your pose so you'll hear this in maybe in a yoga practice a teacher will say surrender into a pose and what that means is to do the work to find the structure the framework the alignment and then to focus on your breath and allow your body to almost drape over the structure and, and melt into the structure of the pose that you found so fully inhabit it allow yourself to melt into that pose to surrender to it Last two full breaths here. And then slowly release and lower down. And then push the floor away enough to inhale to come up onto the knees. And from here, we're going to go into, I think, a lot of people's favorite <laughs> or one of their favorite yin poses, which is the half pigeon. So gently bring your right knee between your hands. It's certainly one of my favorites. And then if your hip is far off the floor on the right side, you're going to place a cushion or a blanket or a block under your bum on that right side. And then you can just test, depending on your hip flexibility, the more the foot moves away from your hips, the more intense the stretch. The closer the foot is to your hip, the less intense the stretch is. So find your edge. And then I invite you to exhale and lower your body over your knee and if you if it feels good hug a cushion or a blanket in towards your torso should make the pose feel more restorative and soft which is good for your nervous system more calming And close your eyes. And so these, this call to surrender, to find 
a an aspect of devotion of offering yourself up to to something beyond you of melting into postures of getting lost in the structure and form of your practice this really chafes against the skeptical mind but i encourage you to explore it because it's so hard for us to imagine and embrace what is what we cannot know what we cannot anticipate we live in the world of google we live in the world where we can observe and anticipate every aspect of our lives from meeting strangers to going places new places traveling to learning about everything we can anticipate and see and research and know about before we experience it in some way and so this idea of surrendering of encountering an unknown and a vague concept is quite difficult for our minds but it is incredibly rewarding it is rewarding in the sense that it encourages us to recognize and honor each time we come onto the mat that there is a greater system of connection of knowledge of intelligence beyond us it helps us to not get hung up on certain details and aspects of our practice to not be attached to the ego It helps us to be mindful through each posture as we surrender into the form. And it helps us get into flow. And the word flow is not just with regards to vinyasa or yoga. Artists use it, writers use it, scientists use it, visionaries use it. It is when you are engaged in an activity from an almost subconscious space and place when what you are doing is moving through you almost coming from another source when you are so fully concentrated on that activity that time and space seems to fade And there is no flow without surrender. There's no flow without giving up and surrendering into the moment, the form, the practice. And so with regards to yoga, you let breath breathe through you. You let yourself be breathed. And through that, you become a vehicle for a deeper and greater process. Your next inhalation, I invite you to lift up, pushing the floor away and maybe taking a nice gentle back stretch, maybe pressing your hands onto the, into the floor to elevate the hips a little bit. I, should say, I shouldn't say back stretch, it's actually a front of torso stretch an arching in the back, back compression. And then exhale to bring your spine to neutral, plant the hands fully on the floor and step back. If you want to, between each side, I invite you to come into a gentle down dog, pedaling your feet, if that feels good. Otherwise, go back into tabletop. 
if that doesn't feel right for you, the ceiling. Don't strain to make a perfect down dog, just allow the shape to fill you and to guide you into a nice stretch and release between each side. And then when you really find your way back into this half pigeon with your left knee between your hands, either going straight from down dog or stopping halfway on your knees. And say, <coughs> excuse me, same process as before. Something soft or supportive under the left bum cheek if you use it on the right. The foot to your edge in a degree away from your hip. And then when you are ready, softening and folding forward over something nice and soft. Coming into your pose. There is this saying that goes, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. And this speaks to a very important aspect of Ishvara, Ishvara Panidana, because to surrender calls on us to dispense with expectations and to trust the process, to trust the flow, to trust the practice. It calls on us to let go of our ideals and expectations and demands and to trust that where we are going is where we are meant to be. And that it will be okay. And so in the everyday, Ishvara Panidana is about opening up to this trust. It is about opening up to the idea of a plan beyond us that's bigger than us, to giving up my plan for a grander idea of the plan and trusting that the plan is okay that everything is okay. And this is a really important thing to mesh with tapas, because tapas is about transformation, about change, about purifying, about doing, about striving, about expanding. And that is super important but it's wonderfully balanced and fruitfully balanced with an encounter of trust and surrender. So once you've done the work, you've expended the energy, you've put everything you can in. And once you've done that with the self-study, with the mindfulness, with the carefulness, you then surrender, you give it up. You let go. You open yourself up to serendipity and to surprise and to new perspectives and to things you had never imagined. People who don't know how to surrender and to trust and embrace the unknown limit themselves in this way. And so surrender is the fifth of the five niyamas because it brings this sweetness. It ties everything together. Once you've done the work and balanced all the aspects, it brings sweetness. It deepens your practice. And it reminds us that 
where we are right now, who we are right now, what we're going through right now is exactly what we are meant to be, where we're meant to be. And the path for tomorrow is okay, that it's going to be okay. Knowing this, embodying this, whilst striving and planning and doing the work is so important for our sanity, for our energy, for our mindfulness, for our mental and emotional stability. I invite you to inhale and lift your chest up. And we'll gently do that arch again to counter the forward bend, pressing the floor away, taking about another two deep breaths here. And then exhale to lower your hips to the floor and you can swing that right leg forward and make yourself ready for your final relaxation. So get that warm blanket and socks or jumper, whatever you have on and nearby. And perhaps you want to place a cushion under your head or back or behind the, behind the knees. It can feel very nice. And once you've done that, I invite you to lie back, to find your corpse pose, to find your Shavasana. Just take a moment to scan your body and ask yourself if you are completely comfortable and if there's anything, even if it's a small adjustment that you could do now, I invite you to do so to make yourself that bit more comfortable. And then once you have found the form of this Critical posture, our corpse pose. I invite you to embrace the knowledge that you have come to the conclusion of your practice. You turned up and with mindfulness and integrity applied yourself to the sequence, to the form of the practice. Through mindfulness and care, you focus, you're engaged in your self-study on the mat. And now it is time to surrender. Now it is time to offer up in sweetness. Now it is time to let go and let yourself be taken up to be breathed, to let breath breathe you to dissolve into the spaces between the thoughts, spaces between the structure of body. To let go completely, trusting the process
I invite you to gently run your tongue over your teeth and the roof of the mouth. And then run your thumb over your fingertips. Maybe wiggle your toes. And if it feels good for you, stretch your arms above your head and take a lovely deep breath in. And then in your own time, in a way that is caring for your body and helps to keep this lovely reflective soft energy, come up to a seated position facing forwards. And I invite you to bring your palms together in front of your chest and to join me in the universal vibration of them. Taking a deep breath in. Loving yourself involves the discovery of the wonder of you. Not only the present you, but the many possibilities of you. It involves the continual realization that you are unique, like no other person in the world. And that life is, or should be, the discovery, the development, and the sharing of this uniqueness so that you can truly envelop and then dissolve into the divine. Thank you so much for joining me. Namaste.